Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Greece Public Library's book break on this very rainy October 21st. Um, I am Kirstra. I'm the one of the librarians here. I moderate the Pints and Prose book discussion group as well as the science fiction and fantasy virtual book discussion group. And I am here as always with Claire. Hi, I'm Claire. I moderate As the Page Turns and also Historical Fiction. And in the keeping of today, I have my Day of the Dead things that I've made here in previous years to get you all in the spirit for some scarier or Halloween-y type reads. Absolutely. So as Claire mentioned, we're doing a theme today, which is horror slash creepy slash scary slash Halloween themed reads. So I'm very excited about this. I love reading creepy books and horror books. I know Claire that this is not 100% in your wheelhouse. So um, I appreciate you playing along with me today. I have enjoyed some of the books that you pointed out. So, so maybe I'm getting there a little bit. Awesome. And you know, not for nothing, um, I'm sure all of our uh, friends gathered with us today, not all of them are gonna like like full horror. So it's nice to have a little bit of a variety of books to, yes. to present. And I'm definitely gonna have that balance, so. <laughs> awesome. Um, do you wanna start, Claire? Sure. Um, I'm gonna start with one. I would not classify this as horror. This is Alice Hoffman, Magic Lessons. For those of you that are familiar with Alice Hoffman, she writes a lot about witches in Salem. And um, her famous book is Practical Magic, which was also a movie. And this is actually the prequel to Practical Magic. So you find out how the Owens family um, gets their curse and just what the backstory is with um, the ladies and their gifts. Um, I kind of love that book. And there's also a sequel, if you really like it. It's called Rules of Magic, which is about some of the children in modern day. And I recommend that as well. But um, Magic Lessons starts in England and um, a baby is abandoned in the snow, but she has got a beautiful blue blanket um, a crow is watching over her and uh, a woman that is a practicing healer in the community finds the baby, knows immediately um, that she's got to be the one to take her in. And um, she takes her back to her cottage, raises her and teaches her like how to heal people, what different herbs to. Um, she's also a witch and she tries to teach her some life lessons as well. She recognizes very early on that the child named Maria has major gifts and is a natural witch. Um, she's got a mark, I think, on her arm. Um, and just different things start leading the, you know that she's, she's got talent. Um, so before you know it, they are interrupted one day at the cottage with a woman knocking on the door beautiful woman, red hair, and also has gray eyes, just like Maria. Um, and of course, Hannah, the older witch that's raising her, sees that this is probably the child's mother, and she is bringing major trouble their way. Um, so it's interesting because she finally learns who her parents are. Um, to kind of just go over a little bit because I don't want to give too much of the story away. The father, of course, is not a great guy. Um, he ends up um, selling her into indentured servant and she goes across the sea to Curacao. Is I, am I saying that correctly? Curacao? Um, uh, Curacao. Yeah, where she learns even more from another because she's constantly seeking out knowledge. So. Um, so she, she's adding to her trade and then she's by, by the time this ends, she's like 16. And of course she, as much as she's been told not to fall in love with the wrong person, she does. And she also has a child and then ends up in Salem, Massachusetts. And of course there are witch trials. There are, um, you know, she's fighting to save her child. There are right loves, wrong loves. 
it's just a really good story, a really good read. Of course, there's creepiness with the witches, and Alice often always kind of spells out some of the ingredients and what they're known to cure or everything. So that's kind of interesting to read, too. Um, if you like animals, there's familiars in here, like hers is Maria's is a crow, her daughter finds a wolf. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a fun read. It's perfect for October. Um, highly recommend Alice Hoffman and Magic Lessons. So. Nice. Um, that's awesome because I don't have a witchy book. So perfect. Very cool. I've actually, I don't think I've ever read any Alice Hoffman. I like her. I've read many of hers. Um, and not all of them have to do with witches, but there's usually some magical realism involved in a lot of them. So. Very cool. All right. Um, so my first one is going to be The Little Stranger by Sarah Waters. Um, this one, I picked up a while ago. It's been out for a while. I think there's actually a series on one of the cable channels somewhere. They've made like a mini series out of it. Um, so this one is kind of a traditional haunted house story with a little bit of a twist. Um, it's set in England uh, just after World War II. Um, our main character is Dr. Faraday. He is a doctor in like a little country village in England um, and in the shadow of Hundreds Hall, which is the big manor house. Um, his mother actually worked there while he was growing up as a maid. Um, so he's lived kind of all of his life in the shadow of Hundreds Hall. Um, the Ayers family is the family that lives in the house. Um, they are, let's see, a mother and her two children who are both in their sort of early to mid twenties. Um, the father has passed the patriarch um, and it's sort of a classic like um, post-war, they have the big house, but they don't have enough money to run it. So the house is kind of starting to gently fall into ruin. Um, the son, Roderick uh, was in the war and sustained some injuries, um, both physical and mental, we start to learn. Um, and the action of the story starts when Dr. Ayers, or I'm sorry, Dr. Faraday gets a call out to the house because um, Roderick has, something has happened, he's had an accident, um, and their normal doctor is not available. So Dr. Faraday goes out and this starts his relationship really with the Ayers family. Um, so over time, he takes a very keen interest in the family. Um, again, he has sort of a previous connection with the house and now um, he kind of starts to ingratiate himself with the family. Um, he has some sort of more modern treatments for some of Roderick's old injuries um, and just generally starts to become kind of helpful to the family. Um, at the same time, uh, some, you know, kind of spooky, peculiar things start happening in the house. Um, things moving, people seeing things, like, uh, you know, hearing things that can't be there. Um, and all of this starts to escalate over the course of the book. Um, so over, I don't want to give really anything away, um, but it is, again, a haunted house story. So there's more stuff that happens, like the paranormal stuff starts to escalate. Um, Dr. Faraday gets more and more entangled with the family, um, and all of this starts to build to some kind of inevitable fallout. Um, I will say I loved the ending of the book. It's very ambiguous. You can interpret what happened in at least a couple of different ways. So the author really lets you draw your own conclusions about what was going on, what happens. Um, and I will say there is not a happy ending to the book, um, but it's an excellent haunted house story, super atmospheric. Um, the post-war setting lets them, lets the author bring in kind of like the 
the man of science, the new man, like he's a doctor, he wants, you know, rational explanations for everything that happens um, when clearly there are things happening that sort of defy rational explanation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really fun. Um, and so you have that layer of it and then the interpersonal layer of Dr. Faraday with this, um, with this kind of old established family that's sort of gently crumbling along with their big manor house. So um, very atmospheric, pretty spooky um, with an excellent ambiguous ending. If you don't like an ambiguous ending, <laughs> you might wanna give this one a pass. Um, like nothing gets tied up with a tidy little bow. Um, but I really, really enjoyed it. I've seen that one on a lot of lists for um, good haunted stories. So I might even try that one. I don't hear you anymore. Did I have myself muted by accident? Oh, yes, yes. There you are. <laughs> Oops. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Moment of panic. Mm. All right. Well, speaking of ambiguous and possibly good book discussion, I have another creepy one called The Immortalist by Chloe Benjamin. Um, so this one, the premise is, if you could know the date of your death, would you A, want to know, and what would you do with that information? Um, the setting of this novel is 1969, New York City, and there are four gold children. Um, that's their name. They're not gold. Um, they live in the Lower East Side, and the oldest boy has heard from classmates and everything a rumor about a visiting psychic who can predict details of your life, and in particular, the day of your death. And he is fascinated and kind of throws down the gauntlet to his siblings on a very hot, stuffy day um, that he wants to go visit and who is, who is with him. So of course, all four of them decide to go. And um, in keeping with the times, I think he felt repressed. You know, this is the time of Woodstock, um, Stonewall rally. There are so many things going on and the gold children are Orthodox Jews and are not really allowed to participate in any of this. The father is a tailor, the mother is a stay-at-home mom. Um, so they all four sneak out and find this building and go see um, the psychic, which is kind of creepy because you don't really know. She seems to know things about them individually, so there's always that, is this a hoax? Is this not a hoax? Does this woman really know this? Um, so what happens is um, the youngest goes in, and um, that's Simon. And then we have Clara, who is kind of obsessed with becoming a magician because people like her grandmother, I believe, was. Daniel, who is the, you know, the number one son, um, very dutiful, respectful usually, and then Baya. So each of these four goes in, receives their prediction, and then it's like chapters of the book are dedicated, like there's sections to each child, and it goes in order of their death. So you have Simon first, who really is the youngest, but he dies first, um, unbeknownst, well, maybe I think one of his siblings knew that he was gay. So after he receives this information, he decides to go off and go to San Francisco and keep in mind the time of AIDS and everything else. So you can almost guess the end of, of that story. Um, Clara does become a magician, but they all do die on the appointed day. So you're left with this. Um, if you have this kind of knowledge, does it lead you to do, like now that you know it, is it going to come true? You know what I mean? The premeditated or- Yeah, the pre predestined. Yes. Yes, I couldn't think of the yeah. right word. So um, we did do this for a book discussion book, and it did generate a lot of good discussion, I thought. But um, there was always that element of creepiness, and then the oldest brother trying to find this woman again, who 
you know, he has started to feel has ruined his siblings and their their life. So, um, oh, of course, there's children involved later and later things. I don't want to give too much of it away, but you know, once you start reading, you just kind of become obsessed to find out what happens to these people, um, and just the whole premise of the story. Really enjoyed it. So, very cool. See another one. I'm probably going to have to put on my list now. Yeah, yeah. We do that <laughs> no, to that one another. Like so. I know all the time. Um, I'm not sure you're going to want to add either of my other two books to your okay. list. I'm being honest. So my next one is probably the the truest just horror book that I have, which is The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. Um, I really, really liked this book. Um, it is set mostly on um, the Blackfeet Indian Reservation um, in, in the West, um, though there are a few other places involved. Um, so the premise is there are four Native men um, who are friends. They go hunting um, on the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Um, and there is an incident. Something happens that um, shouldn't have happened, and there are repercussions that echo into the future. So they have this incident. Um, afterwards, for various reasons, the four friends kind of drift into their own separate ways. Um, and 10 years later, uh, stuff starts happening. Um, things start happening to these four men um, and it becomes clear that um, something is um, trying to avenge the wrong that happened on this hunting trip. Um, I will give a warning, there is some animal stuff near the beginning that is a little upsetting. So if that's something that you have trouble with, um, just be aware that it's there. I almost put the book down, um, but there's sort of that one thing and then you get past it and that the animal stuff ends. So um, just be aware of that. But it's a really, really interesting book. It is very creepy. Um, one of the things that I like most about horror books is the part where you're trying to figure out like is something really happening or is this all just in someone's head? Like, are they crazy or is something real happening? And if so, what is? And um, the author does that part really, really well. Um, so there are like flashes and incidents and you're like, wait, but is, did that really happen? Is it just in his head? So you want to keep going to find out the answer to that. Um, so it's a very interesting horror book to start with. And then the setting is um, not one that you see every day with, you know, the native characters. And um, the author does pull in uh, a lot of native culture, but in a modern context, um, mm -hmm. which I thought was really interesting. And it isn't something that I read a lot or see a lot. So that was cool too. Um, so if you like, uh, straight horror um, in an interesting setting. Highly recommend The Only Good Indians. And if you read it, come and talk to me about it because I feel like this is another one that I need to discuss with people. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing we like better than talking books with people. Nothing. Nothing at all. For sure. All right. So my last one I'm pretty sure you will like. Um, it's called The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. Um, once again, my book of the month club um, and my daughter now has joined. So this was the book she picked. We're trying to read one together each month. Um, so this one is interesting because it's, if you like time travel, and I've always been kind of fascinated with that, it, it kind of is like that. It's in the same vein. It starts in France in 1714, and you have a young girl who um, is very happy in her life. She lives in a little village. Um, she likes going to the market with her father who carves animals and, you know, different things in wood, birds too. Of course, I love that. 
Um, but as she starts aging, um, she starts to realize that her life is just going to be this small because she's going to be expected to, to marry, to produce children, and live pretty much a life of drudgery, um, which she doesn't want. Um, she just feels like there's, she's been out of the town to go to the market. She wants to see what's out there. Um, so she's not conventional in any way. Um, she makes friends with an older woman in the village who is kind of like the local healer slash witch, if you will, um, who kind of encourages this, but she also, she, she tells her that there are still the natural gods out there. And you can pray to them, you can offer, do little offerings and things, but never to pray to the God that answers after dark. So, of course, um, Addie's parents are, you know, she lives with them and she's getting older and they're starting to feel like it's a reflection on them that she's not married and living a conventional life. So they finally drop the bomb that she is to be married, you know, there are no if, ands, or buts, because she's kind of like rejected different suitors for different reasons. But, you know, this is it. You're getting married. You're moving on with your life. So she is running away <laughs> from this ceremony. Of course, it's happening right around sunset. And um, Praise offers a ring that her father carved for her. Um, and of course, someone appears, and it's a person that she has drawn in her journals um, to the T. So it looks like this man that she has been dreaming of. Um, and she asked him to be free. And he grants her wish, but <laughs> of course, there's always a but. She has to sell her soul in the process. And um, she doesn't realize all the repercussions of what she has done. So in order to be totally free, no one that she knows or loves will remember her or recognize her. So she tries to go back and like her parents don't know who she is. Her um, a friend, the, the, the old lady that was the witch, you know, no one knows her. As a matter of fact, they're kind of frightened and it's like she can leave a room, go out, come back in and the whole thing starts all over again. So she's very perplexed. She doesn't have any um, real belongings. So she's got to figure out how to live this life that she has kind of cursed herself with. Um, so she just begins to walk and travel and you go with her to Paris and then other places and parts of it are really sad because, you know, how is she going to make any money? And that answer becomes obvious after a while. Um, but she does kind of figure out that she can steal things or, you know, there's certain ways that she can maneuver. So she starts to figure out the rules and every year um, the devil visits her and asks her to end, you know, give him the soul and the agreement and he'll put her out of her misery. But she starts to like her life um, and the fact that she can go and see things. So it becomes a chess match between Addie and the devil. So this goes on for a number of years until finally she's in New York City. It's been almost 300 years that she's done this. And um, she's stealing a book from a, um, a little bookstore in New York. And then um, she tries to go back the next day and the clerk remembers her. And this has never ever happened to her. So, um, that adds a twist to the story because she begins to have hope that she might have a love interest that will actually remember her. Um, and then you'll find out why he can remember her. So it's, it's really good. Um, if you like a fantasy, um, I want to say like some people compared it to the time traveler's wife. I'm not a huge fan of that book. I did like parts of it, but I, I really like this one and just the way that she really took into account B.E. Schwab, like what she could or couldn't do in this constraining life that she had. So I found it fascinating, really loved it. Nice. 
This one has actually been on my list for a little while. Um, I've read some other V.E. Schwab and really, really enjoy her writing. So um, that one is definitely one that I'm going to have to pick up at some Are point. her other books, like, just out of curiosity, fantasy, sci-fi, or? Um, mostly straight fantasy. Yeah, because I got a very strong fantasy vibe. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I love. So mm -hmm. your mileage may vary, but yeah, V.E. Schwab. <laughs> Um, okay, my last one is um, also a very recent book, and I think actually two of these were Stack of Shame books, so look at me go. Um, but my last book is Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. Um, I really, really, really enjoyed this book. Um, it is uh, as the title would suggest, it is uh, gothic horror. So gothic horror is um, mostly centered around like a creepy house and maybe creepy people who live in the creepy house. And there's usually like a little dash of romance thrown in. Um, so those are kind of the, the main ingredients of a gothic horror. And this one delivers. Um, our protagonist is Noemi. She is a socialite in 1950s Mexico City. Um, she spends most of her time kind of um, going to parties and living the good life. Uh, her father is very wealthy, um, but she does also want to study. So she's in the process of trying to convince her parents to let her go get a master's degree in anthropology. Um, so she, she has sort of a more intellectual side too. Um, but the action of the story starts, her, Noemi's cousin, Catalina, has married into um, another sort of fading wealthy family um, farther south in Mexico. Um, they are the Doyles. So they are an English family who immigrated to Mexico several hundred years before to work a silver mine. So they have all of this, they used to have all of this fabulous wealth from the silver mine, which has since closed down. So now they're another one of these sort of like vaguely aristocratic families, but without the wealth anymore to back it up. And um, Noemi and her father kind of assume that um, Virgil Doyle married Catalina for her money essentially. So she has gone away to live with Virgil Doyle um, in the ancestral house and they've they got this letter this like kind of rambling incoherent letter that's like you have to help me and there are ghosts in the walls and they talk to me and like she sounds Looney Tunes. So Noemi's father is like you have to go and figure out what's happening to her and get her out of the clutches of these people if you need to who just want her for her money and make sure that she's taken care of. And if you do it, I'll let you go to the university and get your master's degree like you want to. So Noemi sets off to go find her cousin and see what's going on. So she arrives at the house, which is called High Place. It's at the top of a mountain. Um, it's perpetually shrouded in mist. Uh, it's kind of this gently crumbling Victorian monstrosity up at the top of the hill, uh, very isolated. Um, and of course, there is a creepy family that lives in the creepy house. Uh, so in addition to Virgil Doyle, there's the patriarch of the family, Howard. Um, there is um, a daughter, uh, another one of Virgil's daughters, and um, her son, who is roughly Noemi's age. Um, so almost immediately, creepy things start happening. Um, and we progress kind of through the traditional Gothic horror arc there, you know, Creepiness gets more creepy, creepy family stays creepy. Um, there is a little bit of a spark of romance with um, the younger Doyle and Noemi um, as she tries to figure out what's going on and what's happening with Catalina. Um, so I don't want to spoil anything um, because it is, it is kind of a wild ride. Um, but the thing that I really liked about it, again, was the unusual setting. Um, so in Mexico, you get a lot of um, Mexican culture. There's quite a bit thrown in. So the Doyles, again, are, are an English family transplanted to Mexico. And um, 
they have sort of, especially the patriarch of the family have sort of very firm and not very flattering ideas about the native Mexican population. Um, there's sort of some, you know, he uh, reads a lot about eugenics and things like that. So he wants to kind of uh, put Noemi down because, you know, because she is mestizo. Um, but luckily she's been studying anthropology so she can hold her own. So you get that little back and forth there. Um, and there is like kind of a big bang of a finale to the book, um, which is pretty satisfying. Um, pretty creepy, like there's some creepy stuff in there. So if you don't like creepy, again, you might want to give this one a miss. Um, but one of the things that I really like about fantasy and horror is that um, they let authors sort of explore ideas in like a totally different context, right? Um, so Mexican Gothic, like it is a story about a creepy house and a creepy family, but there's also a way to read the book as sort of a critique of colonialism and capitalism altogether. So you've got the, you know, European family coming in and trying to, you know, establish roots and um, mine for resources and all of their opinions. So there's that layer of the book too. So there's like the kind of um, pulpy Gothic stuff that's happening, but there is another sort of intellectual layer that's happening at the same time, which I really, mm -hmm really enjoyed and really appreciated. Um, but it's also a super quick read, um, hard to put down. So if you like creepy, gothic, highly recommend Mexican gothic. It I actually fun. started that one. Did you? Mm -hmm. um, and I got to the house. I really like the main character mm -hmm. a lot. So I may yeah. give it another go. It was one of those things I put on hold. It got popular. <laughs> I couldn't renew it because it was on hold. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, but I may try again. Yeah, I think there's still a little bit of a holds list on it. It is um, still pretty recent. Um, but yeah, I really liked it. Well, good. Worth a read. So thank you all for joining us. Um, it is like the most perfect day to curl up with one of these creepy books. Um, and just sink into one. Um, if you all have a favorite creepy book or atmospheric read for this time of year, um, please do share it with us. We're always looking for new stuff to read. Um, Absolutely. Yes. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks. And until then, um, happy reading. And happy Halloween. <laughs> happy Halloween.